All right, <clears throat> welcome back. So, almost done. I'm sorry I missed you guys on Wednesday. I guess somebody showed the video while I was gone. I, I was looking at the videos this morning. I was like, that's weird. There's like me talking, but um, thank you to whoever did that. So today we're going to wrap up the last tiny little bit of stuff you guys need before you take your final midterm on uh, over the weekend on Sunday or Monday. So please sign up to do that next week. Obviously, on Monday, I can't talk about really, you know, anything new that we're going to assess because you guys will be done with all the quizzes and, and the exams at that point. Um, we will have a couple new homework problems next week. And so on Monday, we'll talk about uh, functional programming in Java, which is pretty fun. And on Wednesday, um, that'll be our last time together, um, at least, you know, at this time. And we'll do the ISIS forms and we'll talk a little bit about um, some things that we have on tap and, and look back at the semester and look at all that you guys have accomplished, which is really fun to do, right? So we'll look at some stats about, you know, um, all the hard work you guys did this semester. All right, so today's topic is Java generics. And you guys have been working with these, so I'm going to reprise a little bit of uh, what you saw on Wednesday and remind you a little bit about how we've been using these. And then we're going to talk a little bit about actually how to create generic classes. So you can actually take advantage of this feature of Java when you build your own Java classes. All right, so um, as a review, we, we've seen generics and we've been using lists and maps. So these were kind of the two, you know, I refer to these as the two data structures you meet in heaven. They're incredibly useful. And what you'll find as you go forward as you're in your career in software development as a programmer and you're actually solving real problems, you can do a lot with just these two data structures. With lists and maps, you'll find that together by using those, you, you know, there's times when you need a more fancy data structure and, and you'll know, you know, particularly when you go on to take 225, you'll know about some of the options out there in that space. But a lot of times when you're writing particularly high level code or applications, you know, lists and maps are enough to get a lot of the work done that you need to do. These are the data structures I use in, you know, 98, 99% of the programming I do. Um, and so we showed you guys how to implement those a little bit. We talked about how to implement maps last time when we talked about hashing. Um, but normally you're going to use Java's built-in implementations. And so what we've seen uh, when we've been using these is that these are examples of both generic classes and generic interfaces, both of which we're going to talk about. Um, and the reason for this is because it allows us to achieve this uh, type safety that we wanted, right? So for example, on uh, this little snippet of code, um, here, here this is sort of showing you the problem, right? So I can, I can do this. You can do this in Java. You can use, this is what's called a, using a bare list. So you'll see up here when I declare on line eight my list um, reference variable and my list implementation on the right side, those are not parameterized by a type in angle brackets as we've encouraged you to start doing. This means I can put anything into this list, any Java object. Um, and that seems like it might be a good thing. The problem is what comes out when I retrieve something from the list is also an object. So you can sort of think about this as anything that gets put into this bare list gets upcast automatically. Remember upcasting, downcasting, uh, polymorphism in Java's type system. Um, everything that I put in gets automatically upcast to an object. And so when it comes out on line 12, it's, I can't use it as a string. And so if you try to compile this uh, code, you're going to see that the compiler is going to tell you there's a problem, and the first problem is on line 12. Because list.get returns an object, and I'm trying to assign it to a string reference. And the same thing happens down, it will happen down here with my map. So this is an example of using a bare map. Again, on the left side, I have an unparameterized um, interface reference variable, and I have an unparameterized uh, implementation of a map. This is used as hashes internally. Um, so even if I comment out this line of code, now I'm going to get a compiler error further down on line 19, because again, I have the same problem. Anything I put into a bare map or a bare list, I can put in anything I want, but it always comes out as an object. And so what we would like is we would like, you know, again, this goes back months, right? We talked about a little bit when we talked about how the Java compiler works. We would like to turn as much as possible runtime errors, things that might cause your app to crash, you know, when people download it from the Play Store, or the thing that's going to cause 
the new service that you're demoing when you're trying to get some VC funding to crash in front of you know, the, the, the venture capitalists on Sand Hill Road, right? Like, we'd like to take these errors and get rid of them and change them to compiler errors because the compiler errors are gonna be things you're gonna have to fix. So the more the compiler can help you debug things like this and identify problems, the better. And right now, so if I go back, you know, again, just a little bit of review, I can get this example to work, right? So what do I have to do here to get this code to compile and run, right? So anything I put in is an object. So what do I need to do here to fix this code so that it compiles and executes? Anybody remember? Good review, object stuff, yeah. Yeah, I've got to downcast it to a string. So what I'm getting out of my list is an object, but now I've got to downcast this to a string, and here I've got to downcast this to an integer, right? And now, now it'll work. But here's the problem, right? Those downcasts are unsafe. If the thing that I'm trying to downcast turns out to not be a string or not be an integer, now I've got a runtime error. So let's try this. Let's put something into my list that's not a string. Now I've got a class cast exception when I run the code. So this is now a runtime error. This is the kind of thing I'm trying to avoid. And the error is caused by the fact that the thing I got out of my list isn't a string. And so you can imagine how this gets really awful, you know, um, to, to try to program with these types of things, right? You know, you're gonna put comments all over the place in your code. This list is only for strings, right? But if somebody puts something into it that's not a string by accident, and you happen to pull it out and assume it's a string and try to downcast it to a string so that you can do string things with it, um, this is not going to work, right? So we have this inherent problem with these classes. And so what we'd like to be able to do is to allow the compiler to help us. We want to be able to tell the compiler what type of things we're going to put in the list or what type of things we're going to put in the map. Um, and this is to allow the compiler to help us check things to make sure that when we get thing, something out of the list, if the list was, if we told the compiler this list is going to store strings and we take the thing from the list and try to do something that we can only do with an integer or a number or some other type of object, the compiler can actually tell now because we're providing a little bit more information that the compiler can use to help us, right? And so, and, and so what we've seen in the past is that, and we, again, we've encouraged you guys to use this, um, you know, you can use bare lists in Java, and this is because before, I think, Java 5, this feature wasn't part of the language, and so there's legacy code in Java that still uses bare lists and bare maps. But you should never do this. Instead, what you should do is you should tell the compiler what you're gonna put in the list. So this declaration tells the compiler, hey, I'm creating a list of strings, right? So I put my, sorry, a list of integers. I put my type in angle brackets following the uh, type declaration here, and then I have, um, I can call this whatever I want. So this says my integer list is going to be a list of integers here, and this is a bug, there should be a name here, but I'm declaring a map that maps from integers to strings, right? So again, now anytime I put something into my map, the compiler can check to make sure the key is a string and the value is, um, is that backwards? No, sorry, the key is an integer and the value is a string. When I get something out, the compiler's gonna be able to check and make sure that the value is a string. So, and, and on the right side here, so this is something, this is also something new, I think, as of Java 8. This is called the diamond. That's how they refer to it in the documentation. Um, and so, what the diamond does is it allows you to avoid repeating yourself. So if you want to, you can put list integer integer list equals new array list integer and repeat the type. But the Java compiler, despite not being super intelligent, is smart enough to figure out that, okay, if your variable is a list that stores integers, then your implementation is probably also an array list that stores integers. And essentially, the diamond operator will allow the compiler to infer, this is called typer inference, the type of the implementation of the right side of the expression from the left side. So down here, I'm using the diamond operator. This will give me a hash map that maps from integers to strings. Okay, so this is all sort of review. Um, but, but why are generics part of the language? So again, I wanna take a step back before we start to actually use these in part of our code and talk about the fact that these really allow us to combine two really desirable features of the language. So one is polymorphism. We're gonna see this in a minute. Because every Java object inherits from capital O object, there are certain features that every object has. 
that are useful. And so we can build certain very general purpose data structures. Again, we're gonna do this in a minute, in a way that allows us to only utilize the features that are provided by object or maybe by other things if we need to, um, and build very general purpose data structures that can now operate on any type of Java object. But we could already do that, right? We did this. When we built our simple list, that list could store any type of Java object. What we were missing, what generics bring into the picture is this type safety aspect, type checking. The compiler's ability to look at your code and make sure that you're using a particular variable properly. Make sure that you're putting things into the list that the list is designed to store, right? So we get, the gen we get sort of the generality of capital O object and the power of Java polymorphism without sacrificing the type safety. In the past, when we've built our simple lists and our simple trees, we've had to sacrifice type safety in order to achieve this generality. Now we're gonna bring type safety and type checking back into the picture. All right, so, so this is our example of how to declare, um, you know, uh, to, to use type parameters when we declare our lists and maps. And again, this is something that you should do. So in contrast to the previous example, now when I try to run this code, I get a compiler error. Because I've told the compiler that the list at the top is a list of strings. And so I can add things to it on line 10, but when I try to add something to it that's an integer on line 14, the compiler will tell me this is a problem. So again, there's no way to ship this code because it doesn't even compile. So I have to fix this before I go on, right? Same thing down here with the map. So I've declared that the map maps from string to integers. If I try to put a mapping that's from integer to integer, which is what I'm trying to do on line 22, that will also generate a compiler error. So again, this is, this is a very, very attractive feature, right? I'm leveraging the compiler to check my code before, um, before I use it. Okay, so we've seen how to use this, but our goal today is actually to show you, uh, we've seen how to use this from the perspective of declaring your own built-in types. But what about if you wanna design a container or some sort of class in Java that actually you wanna use this to generify your own classes? So what we're gonna do today, one of our examples, is we're gonna go back to our simple list that we implemented, and we're gonna actually add this feature. We're gonna make it generic so that we can not only use it to store any type of Java object, but we can make sure that the objects that we put into it are of the right type. All right, so this requires, as you might guess, introducing some new Java syntax. So when we declare our classes that use um, Java generics or accept a type parameter, um, you'll see this new piece of syntax over here. Um, so this declares a class called simple linked list, and in angle brackets, and the, the comment should say E is a type parameter, this indicates that my class will accept a type parameter, okay? So E is a type, it's a Java type, string, integer, double, sweet old dog, whatever, any, any Java type that's declared uh, as part of your project. Now you'll see throughout the rest of my class, I'm using that parameter in certain places. So my get, we're, we're going back and we're looking at our linked list interface, right? Um, sorry, our linked list implementation. So get now returns something of type E. Before get returned an object, now get returns whatever the type that the class was uh, created with, right? Um, and set, the same thing. So set takes an index to set in the list, but it also takes a value of the type that we parameterize the list with, okay? So again, this is new, right? Inside these angle brackets, um, I'm declaring that the class accepts a type parameter, and I can use that type parameter anywhere that I would normally see a type. So instead of a return type, I use the type parameter. Instead of a type indicating what kind of variable has to be passed to this method, I use a type parameter, right? Now, this is, a, this is something important to understand. Type parameters are not variables. It's a parameter. So I can't do this, for example. I can't take my type parameter and assign an actual concrete type to it. There's actually no way to assign a type parameter anywhere inside a generic class. I can use it in declarations, 
uh, when I declare variables, when I indicate the return method of functions, but I can't assign it, I can't read from it into another variable. Um, so th this sort of thing doesn't work, right? Okay. So here's one mental model that's helpful to understand how generic classes actually work. Part of what the, now, I wanna be careful before I do this, because this is one of the places, and I try to avoid this, but this is one of the places where the explanation is actually not lined up with reality. This is actually not what the compiler does, but it's a good mental model to think about how generic types work. So you can imagine the following. So here's my generic list class. This class takes a type parameter E. It has two methods. It has a get method that returns an object of the type of the type parameter, and it has a set method that takes an index and a value of the same type as whatever type parameter. So down here, I've created a list, and I've passed in string as my type parameter. String is a type in Java. It's one of the job built-in Java classes. So you can think of what happens is this code that I provided is rewritten so that it looks like this. So everywhere, so first of all, what did I do? I got rid of the type parameter up here, and everywhere that I found E, I replaced it with string. So these are essentially the same thing, okay? Again, this is not what happens internally, but it's not a bad way to think about it. So when I take a, a generic class and create an instance of it, what I get is essentially this. It's almost as if this is the code you wrote, right? What's the difference? Well, the difference is that this list can only store strings whereas this list can store anything. But what I'm getting is almost something that works as if the list could only store strings, right? So what if I create it with integers? Then again, I go through, I remove the, the type parameterization of the class, and anywhere I see E, I replace it with the type that was passed. Questions about this before we go on? This is fun to do at this point because it's a new sort of brain-bendy thing to do at the end of the semester. Yeah. What, you mean the homework got ahead of lecture? Yeah, that happened. Previously? No. No. There, uh, well, okay, I'll come back to that. You did not have to do this on the homework. However, I promised you a long time ago that I would explain those error messages, right? And this is part of the reason why, right? There were certain cases where those warnings that you saw about unchecked operations were not going to go away unless you made your class generic, right? Um, okay. So again, this is not actually what happens. So what the compiler actually does is something called type erasure. The compiler actually creates only one version of the generic class that accepts any type of object. Um, and then that's what you actually use when your code runs. So when the code runs, all that type information that you're providing to the compiler so that it can check to make sure things work properly is gone. This is something called type erasure. That information is used when your code is compiled to catch problems, but then it's discarded before your code actually runs. Um, all right, so, but again, this isn't a bad mental model. So again, this is something that's sort of confusing, but if you're thinking about, okay, you know, how does this particular class work, in a, and you wanna think about a concrete instance, like if I create a list of integers, you can think of taking the class, stripping off this uh, type parameter, replacing E with integer everywhere you see it, and just creating a, a list uh, directly. So this is code you've already seen. This code should be totally familiar, right? This code is new, has some new features. Um, so this is how to take it in a concrete instance from something that has these new features to something that's familiar, okay? If you need, if you need to think about how this works. Okay, great. So, yeah. Ah, well, let, let's come back to that. Yeah, yeah. So the, so the question is, uh, what's the difference between using uh, E and using object, right? Um, and, well, actually, no, actually, let's, let's, let's do that right here, right? So, so in this case, right, let's talk about this. So imagine I have the code over here, right? What can I not pass to set? If I had object here, right, then my set method would take an object as a value correct? 
Is that, is that fair? But what can I not pass to set now that I could if it took an object? Can I pass a string to set? No. No, it's not, it's, 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 it's more, I can't cast a string to an integer, right? They have no relationship to each other, right? And so this, what this is doing is it's forcing me to use the right type when I call set, right? And so that's, that's the critical difference. If I just, I can create this class and I can have object everywhere, right? And that will allow me to use any object, but it doesn't force me to use the type that I provide in the parameter, right? So what this does is it says, what you have now is an implementation of lists that will only store integers, right? And that's what I want, because that's what I asked for here, right? So again, if I tried to do set zero with, and passed a string, that doesn't even compile, because the compiler can uh, check to see, okay, you declared this to take integers, uh, it's not gonna accept the string. Okay, we'll probably, like, uh, re-raise that objection in a minute, uh, when we actually start writing some code, okay. So I can take multiple type parameters, you actually, I'm only bringing this up because you see this with maps. So our, typically our, our list classes, we only need one type parameter, that's what the list stores. But in a map, remember that we have keys and values. A map key can be any Java object. And so when I see map declared, I actually have two type parameters here separated by comma. So throughout my map code, I can use both K and V, and those stand for key and value, as you would expect, as type parameters. There are some naming conventions that you will see in Java for naming these type parameters. There's actually no rules about this as far as I know. You can use any uh, string you want, um, but here are, the, here are kind of the conventions because you'll see this in documentation. So by convention, type names are single uppercase letters, okay? One character, uppercase. So you see T, K, V, E, et cetera. Again, these aren't rules, you could break them, but this is, this is what you'll see in the documentation. Um, certain type parameters have certain meanings, so you'll see them used in certain places. So for example, E is for an element. <clears throat> e, uh, e gets used in lists, in sets, anything that organizes like a collection of, of items, right, is an element. Um, K and V are for keys and values, so those get used in maps, right, which we just talked about. Uh, N is for a number, uh, there's some other rules for the other ones, but these are the ones that, that you should expect to see. So, so again, let's go back and look at how a map would work, right, with two type parameters. So here I have a generic map class with a key and a value. My get method takes something of type key, of type K, and returns something of type V. My put method takes a key and a value, the key should be the same type as the type parameter for the key k, the value should be the same thing as the type for the value parameter v. So if I instantiate it with a string and a double, this is kind of what I get. So this is the mental model to think about. What I, what I end up with is it's almost as if this is the class that I wrote. Because everywhere that I've, uh, so what I told the compiler is that the keys are strings and the values are doubles. And so anywhere I saw V, I replaced it with double, here and here. Anywhere I saw K, I replaced it with string. But now I can't put anything but a string as a key into this map. The compiler will make sure it never happens. And the compiler also knows that what comes out of this map, when I call get, is a double. So if I try to have a string variable and assign it to the result of calling get on this map, it'll fail. All right. So again, here's another example, same thing. All right, so, so now let's generify our uh, existing simple linked list class. So this is uh, code that we wrote together earlier in the semester. Um, you know, we have, it's a simple linked list, we have our uh, item inner class that stores an object as a value. And all of our methods right now, so for example, we take an object array, um, when we add something, we take an index and an object to add, um, and, and what this means um, is that, let's see what happens when I run this, okay, good. Um, what this means is that there's no type safety associated with this class. I can put anything I want into it, right? So when I'm done, 
adding all of these values, I can do simple list.add zero whatever, um, and that works fine. And I can't provide a type parameter here. So if I do simple list um, string, you know, it's, it's not going to compile. Because I haven't told the compiler yet that simple list takes type parameters. So let's take this existing class. So again, right now, this class has the benefit that it can work on every Java object, but it doesn't have the benefit of type safety. So I can't tell the compiler what should go into this, um, this list. So for example, what I'm putting into this list are integers. So what I'd like to be able to do is to tell the compiler, I'm only putting integers into this list. And then when I get to line 89, that should fail. It should cause a compilation failure, not a runtime failure, a compilation failure. So when I'm developing my code, I'm gonna see this problem immediately. Oh, whoops, you know, this list is for storing integers and I'm trying to put a string into it. Okay, so how are we gonna do this? So the first thing we have to do is we actually have to parameterize simple linked list, okay? I'm gonna use the type parameter E here. E is for an element. That's what we use for lists and other things like that, okay? Um, you could use T if you want, but I think E is the right choice given the Java convention. So I'm gonna add this to my declaration, all right? Now what I need to do is I need to go through and I need to find everywhere where I am using that type and make sure that I replace it with E, all right? So let's start with my um, I'm, I'm gonna, let, uh, we'll come back to the inner class in a minute. Let's start with the constructor. So what should the constructor take? Right now the constructor accepts an array of objects, but now that I parameterize this with this type parameter E, what should my constructor require? I shouldn't be able to pass in an array of any type of object, I should have to pass in an array of what type? Yeah, E. Okay, so that's, that's pretty easy. Um, what about down here? So my add function, now again, we're not just gonna go around replacing stuff willy-nilly, it depends on what's appropriate. So my add function takes an index, that I wanna, that stays put, that's where to put the item. But it also now takes an object. So I don't wanna be able to add any kind of object to my list now, I'm only gonna add objects of type E. So my remove method pulls something out of the list and returns it. So my remove method, needs to re return something of type E, and then my get method also needs to return something of type E. And my set method should take an argument of type E, all right? So that's a starting point. Now let's go back and deal with our inner class. So this item class was something that we used to wrap the um, values that we stored in our linked list, so it stores the object, and then it stores a reference to the next item in the list. So now, this, I can also use type parameters in my inner class. So my inner class is going to use the type parameter from the parent. So I'm gonna replace the reference that it stores with not an object, now it stores a reference to something of type E, and I'm gonna also replace the constructor to take an argument of type E, not of type object. So I'm, I'm close, I have a little bit more work to do here if I go through and I look at how things are working. Um, so this add is going to work, right, because now I'm calling new item with the, the right type. Um, remove, I need to clean up a little bit more. So I can use my type parameter inside a function just like, you know, uh, I can use it anywhere. I can use it in a function declaration, but I can also use it inside the code of a function. So now, my, uh, the thing I'm returning is actually um, something of type E, okay? And then down here, get seems okay, set seems okay, um, get item looks okay. Let's try running this and see what happens, okay. Ah, okay, so this is interesting. So I actually have a compiler error inside my code. Does anyone know why? There's actually a bug in this code that we didn't see before, we just found. You guys in the back, can you? Yeah, thanks. What's the bug? Who can spot it? Yeah. Yeah, and what is type start? Yeah, 
So actually, this is really interesting. So by doing this, I've actually caught a bug in my existing code. What I was doing before was this function is supposed to return the value of the item that the, uh, has been removed. What it was doing before was returning the item itself. So I've got to replace start with start.value, and then down here, I'm gonna have another problem on line 44 because I'm doing the same thing again. Okay. So, I'm done. Parameterizing. Now I have a compiler error in my main function. And this is the compiler error that I wanted. This, the whole thing I just did was designed to create this error because now I have a linked list class that I can use safely. I've told the compiler on line 85 that the only thing I'm gonna put in here are strings, or sorry, integers, and I've added a string. So if I get rid of this, you'll see that the code is gonna run, and it really, uh, it's, it's unchanged, except for the fact that I can now use it safely. Questions about this before we go on? You guys will have a chance to do this, I think, on today's homework problem. Maybe you already did this yesterday, right? This is all review, which should be great. So this is an example of how to take code that we wrote that was general, it would work on any object, now it's gonna work, um, not only work on any object, but it's gonna work safely. So if I change this to string, you're gonna see I'm gonna get a compiler error here on line 87 because I'm adding something that's not, not a string. Okay, any questions up till this point? Because now we're gonna have some more fun with this. I think we're basically where we left off on Wednesday, yeah. Yeah, you can. Yeah. You don't. So what you get here, great question. Okay, so what you get here is you get something called a bare class, right? So this class has no type safety in it. I can use, I can put in any object, right? Now the problem is, so for example, let's say I wanted to do this. So this, I'm putting in integers, right? If I wanna say integer temp is equal to simple list dot remove, now I get this compiler error because what's coming out of it is an object, right? So now let's go back and put our, our type parameter back in. So we're gonna say I'm gonna use this to store integers and I need, I think I need to put the, I think I forgot to put the diamond operator over here, right? Now it works, right? So yeah, if I don't provide, I, and you can do this, you can do this with maps, you can do this with lists. The reason is, as I mentioned before, there's legacy code as part of Java that doesn't use this feature. Right? So you don't have to provide type parameters to generic classes. If you don't, you're gonna get that warning from the compiler about using unchecked or unsafe operations. Yeah, so that's where that warning comes from. Um, you want, in, in general, you want to do this because it helps you catch mistakes, right? It's also more convenient because now what I get out of there is an integer, right, rather than an object, right, which is a little bit more easy. Great question. Yeah, so I can, I can go back here, I can take my generic class and I can use it without a type parameter, um, and now I get this uh, compiler, right? Um, because what I get out here is an object, not, not, um, not an int. Good question. Okay, so. Now, let's talk about something else we can do with, with generic, uh, generic instantiation and generic types. So, what if I wanted, so now I wanna take this class max, right? C can you guys actually stop talking? Thank you. The two of you in the, in the back row. Thanks. So now I wanna take this class max and I actually wanna make it generic, all right? So this was something, and this is an example from earlier in the semester. I can't remember this on a homework problem or something we did in class. But I've got a class that stores a array of integers. And it allows me to, you know, I basically can instantiate it with some values. And then I have a max function that goes over the array and figures out which value is the largest. So I would be, like to be able to change this so that I can run it on any Java object. Okay, so what's the problem with this? Sounds like fun. What, what's, what's an issue with this approach? I mean, let's try it, right? So I can start, um, I'm gonna use T here as my type parameter, okay? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna create a type parameter. I'm changing, you know, my, 
private array, so it's the right type. Um, now max is gonna return something of type T. Um, I'll set the type of the, the, the thing that I'm using to store this. Okay, where do I run into trouble here? I don't have integers anymore. I have some arbitrary Java object. But what needs to be, so I've gotta do something right here, right, yeah. Yeah, how do I compare two arbitrary Java objects? Okay, so I've gotta replace line 12. I've gotta fix line 12 so it works, okay? But what has to be true about these Java objects in order for this to work? I need something a little bit more than them just being an object, yeah. They have to be comparable. Ah, right, so, let's start over. I could have, I'm gonna get rid of the type parameter. I could have done this originally. So now, essentially, my code is operating on comparables. And now I'm gonna do is gonna say compare to current max. And if that's greater than zero, I always get this backwards. Maybe that's right, maybe it's the min, we'll find out in a minute. Um, so, so now I've replaced everything with comparables, okay? Which is fine, I can do this. So now I have a class that will uh, compute the maximum over um, a, a group of comparables, but here's the problem, right? So let's say I say integer um, actual max is equal to max dot max. I have the same problem I was having before. I can create a new instance of max and I can pass it integers. But what happens is that array of integers gets upcasted by Java to an array of comparables. And so what comes out of my class is no longer an integer. It's now a comparable. Now again, I can do the same thing I did before. If I know what the type is, I can stick an explicit class here and that'll work. I don't wanna do that, it's not safe. All right, so how can I generify this class? So here's what I can do, and again, this is, this is just sort of bonus material, this is interesting, it's fun, but it gives us a chance to again think about the fact that the Java compiler knows the relationships between classes when it compiles the code. So what I can do is I can essentially say, I can use what's called a bounded type parameter to make sure that my class, to allow my class to be generic, but to make sure that the generic type has some feature that I want, okay? So in this case, the generic type T, if I use this type um, parameter, what I tell the compiler is, I'm gonna accept a generic type parameter called T, but T has to extend S. So either T has to be a descendant of S, if we're talking about object inheritance, or T has to implement S, if we're talking about an interface, okay? I can do this in a couple of other ways. Here's a way basically saying, I need a type T that extends either S or U or V. Again, like this is just sort of fun, uh, wild fun stuff, right? Okay, so now I've, we're gonna start here with um, a, um, an example where I've, I've essentially gone through and I've generified this class, but I'm using a type parameter T. So I've changed my array to be of type T, I've changed my constructor to take an array of type T, I've changed my function to return something of type T, but I get a compiler error because I'm trying to use compare to, and I Java, the Java compiler is not sure that what I pass in here implements compare to. So for example, I could pass objects, I could pass some class that doesn't implement compare to. So how do I fix this? Instead of saying that my class is parameterized with a type T, I require that it extends compare. So now what the compiler is able to do is it's able to guarantee that the whatever type I'm parameterized with implements comparable. So if I try to create max with object, this now produces a compiler error. That's what we want. Because the compiler knows that objects don't implement comparable. I need a class that implements comparable, so I can, cr I can compute the max of uh, integers, which is what I'm doing right here. I can compute the max of strings, which also implement comparable. 
Um, right? I can, I can use anything that implements the parable. Two is the max because it sorts lexicographically to the end of four. But again, just a, this is just a glimpse downstream. Like, we could spend a week talking about generics. The Java generic type system is actually um, incredibly powerful and allows you to specify a wide variety of constraints on the generic types that could pass to your class. But this is just an example of, again, so now what I have here is I have a generic class that can compute the maximum of the, an array of any type of object that I can compare to another instance of that same type. So anything in Java that's comparable, I can now find a maximum of. And I can do it safely, right? So when I retrieve the maximum here, I don't have to do, um, I don't have to do any nasty downcasting, right? What I'm getting out is gonna be a string. Okay. Last couple of comments about this before, before we, we wrap up. So, interfaces can also use type parameters and do use type parameters. This is important. So here's an example of an interface that accepts a type parameter, right? And that type parameter is used throughout the interface to indicate methods that the class should implement and where the type should play a role. So for example, this says, if you implement an interface simple, link, simple list that takes a type parameter, your get method should return an instance of that type. Your remove method should return an instance of that type, right? Um, okay. Again, there's a lot more that we could say about generics that I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop here because your brains are probably tired. Um, there's, there's one thing I do want to point out because it's a common stumbling block. It's something that I ran into when I was learning this stuff. Um, unfortunately, you cannot create an array, a new array of generic objects of a particular type. So for example, um, this does not work. I've got a class here, parameterized with a type parameter. I cannot create an array of that type. If you wanna know why, you know, look up the, you know, Google it or look up the documentation. There's a, there's, there's a somewhat interesting reason why this is true. Um, however, if you want, you can still store objects of that type. You can use an array list or a map or a variety of other things. So I can take my type parameter and I can pass it to, uh, I can use it both when I declare the reference um, for my array list and I can use it when I create the array list. So I can use type parameters in Java collections, but I can't use them in arrays. Um, this does kind of start to become a pain in, in certain places and some of the Java built-in classes have some pretty nasty workarounds for this. Okay, so that is it about generics. Any questions about this before we wrap up with a couple of announcements? David. Yeah, so the question is, what, do I, if, what if I know that I have a list that I just want to store integers? That's exactly what generics are for, right? So when I write my code, I declare a list reference of list parameterized by integers. The benefits that I get here are that I, so if you look at, if you think about how Java collections work, like array lists, maps, there's one implementation for array lists that works for every Java object, right? And so I don't have to write one implementation for strings, one implementation for integers, one implementation for whatever. I would have millions of those. There's lots of different Java classes. Instead, I write one generic implementation that works for everything, but if I use generics, I still get the type safety that I want. So the compiler, so, and, and this is exactly the use case that we're discussing, right? So if I have a list that I know I only want to put integers in, use integer as a type parameter. That way, if you, if you or your partner or some idiot that works at your company that's dumb, um, you know, tries to put something into that list that's on an integer, the compiler will point that out, right, and refuse to compile it. That's a great question. Yeah. Yep. Ah, 
great question. So, so the question is, what about this, right? Um, so, ex so, so the question was, can't a child only have one parent? It's true, but what can Java classes do that would allow them to, that would allow this to be appropriate? I can only have one parent, but I can, yeah? I can implement multiple entities. Yeah, so if I had three different, inter this is not common, okay? I just, it's just kind of interesting. Uh, but if I had like, you know, a couple different interfaces that all provided, you know, uh, complementary functionality, then I could do, yeah. yeah. Great, great, great observation. Other questions? All right, so there will be, I think there's a couple of multiple choice questions on the midterm about generics. There is, there is no programming with generics on the midterm, right? But we do have um, the moment. Okay, so we are almost done. So on Sunday, as a reminder, Sunday and Monday, you guys have your final midterm in the CBTF. This is cumulative. It does focus mostly on the data structures and algorithms part of the class. So the stuff that we've been covering since we stopped talking about objects. But look, at this point, you gotta know everything. You're gonna have to write loops. You're gonna have to declare classes. You're gonna have to deal with inheritance maybe. Like these are all, you know, everything that we've done is built on things in the past. So, you know, um, you know be prepared for that. But if you wanna prepare, I would say the questions that are most useful to review are the homework problems that you've been doing for the past couple of weeks. Um, okay, so on Monday, we're gonna be back here. We'll talk a little bit about streams and about some functional programming in Java. I hope you'll join us. It's really interesting stuff. Uh, there is like, there is, I think, two homework problems next week on this. Um, on Wednesday, we'll do the ISIS forms in class, so please come for that. Um, Thursday is the project fair. On Friday, we'll do awards here at one o'clock and wrap up. Um, so again, midterm starts on Sunday. Good luck with that. Um, your final projects will be evaluated in lab next week. So this is the chance to make a push on that. Remember, there's extra credit available for labs that produce the most impressive projects. I have office hours today from one to three. We stop by, enjoy the beautiful weather. I will see you on Monday. Good luck on the midterm.